and free on all platforms. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, my path was clearer. So that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. A historic moment on Capitol Hill. At the center of it all, Katanji Brown Jackson on the cusp of shattering a glass ceiling. Tonight, the confirmation of the first black woman nominated to the Supreme Court. Her parents beaming, her husband wiping away tears as she uses this stage to deliver a message to her young daughters. I hope that you've seen that with hard work, determination, and love, it can be done. The assault on civilians in Ukraine rages on the latest, a missile attack on a shopping mall in Kyiv, killing at least eight people. So far, the deadliest strike on the city as Ukrainian President Zelensky makes a new address to his people. President Biden speaks to several European leaders ahead of his emergency NATO summit in Brussels. The warning tonight that Russia may soon launch cyber attacks on the United States. The crush of refugees moving into neighboring countries still unrelenting. People desperate for stability after being forced to leave their life behind in a war-torn country. Tonight, the work that the Polish government and people are doing to help them for the long haul. We don't have home there, don't have friends, nothing. Everything is gone. A high-speed stunt caught on camera. The viral video shows a rented Tesla as it goes airborne, crashes into parked cars, and is then abandoned. And behind the lens. Every year at the Oscars, it was friends over, you get dressed and eat food, and we would all watch the Oscars yeah. live. Zeroing in on the talented women of music vying for the Oscars this year, Billie Eilish and Diane Warren nominated for Best Original Song. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Some say they thought that what played out today in Washington, D.C. was a scene they might not see in their lifetime. History in the making. For the first time, a Supreme Court confirmation hearing is now underway for a black woman. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson getting a bit emotional today just before she gave her opening statement. Judge Jackson telling the Senate Judiciary Committee how her parents raised her, telling her if she worked hard and believed in herself in America, she could do anything or be anything she wanted to be. Today, the 22 senators who will help determine if that American dream will include her serving on the nation's highest court gave their opening statements, many praising her qualifications, but several Republicans also outlined some of their doubts. While today was a bit of a victory lap, tomorrow the work begins with some tough questions. The Democrats likely already have the votes that they need in order to confirm Judge Jackson on their own, but they do hope to convince some Republicans to vote with them as well. We're standing by to be joined by Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. But first, ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off on Capitol Hill. On the first day of her confirmation hearings, the weight of history plain to see on the face of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Judge Jackson introducing herself to the country as the daughter of school teachers. To express both pride in their heritage and hope for the future, they gave me an African name, Katanji Onyika which they were told means lovely one. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, my path was clearer. So that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. Her father, Johnny Brown, there behind her, as she described how he inspired her by becoming a lawyer himself. My very earliest memories are of watching my father study. He had his stack of law books on the kitchen table while I sat across from him with my stack of coloring books. Her husband, Dr. Patrick Jackson, a surgeon overwhelmed with emotion. I have no doubt that without him by my side from the very beginning of this incredible professional journey, none of this would have been possible. We met in college more than three decades ago, and since then, he's been the best husband, father, and friend I could ever imagine. Patrick, I love you. 
As her two daughters looked on, Jackson acknowledging the challenges of being a working mother. Girls, I know it has not been easy as I've tried to navigate the challenges of juggling my career and motherhood. And I fully admit that I did not always get the balance right. But I hope that you've seen that with hard work, determination, and love, it can be done. I am so looking forward to seeing what each of you chooses to do with your amazing lives in this incredible country. This is her fourth so Senate confirmation much. hearing. She's been a judge for nearly a decade and said it's her duty to be independent. I know that my role as a judge is a limited one, that the Constitution empowers me only to decide cases and controversies that are properly presented. And I know that my judicial role is further constrained by careful adherence to precedent. And she closed with this. I have dedicated my career to ensuring that the words engraved on the front of the Supreme Court building, equal justice under law, are a reality and not just an ideal. Thank you for this historic chance to join the highest court, to work with brilliant colleagues, to inspire future generations, and to ensure liberty and justice for all. The chair of the Judiciary Committee ending today's hearing saying, now comes the hard part. In a way, it's the easiest day because 10 minutes is merely a throat clearing warm up for most senators on this committee. <laughs> Starting tomorrow will be some serious exchange in questions. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, certainly a historic day for this nomination. Uh, just give us a sense of the mood and the emotion surrounding today's hearing. Yeah, Lindsay, you could really feel the weight of this moment in the room, not only from the emotions from Judge Jackson herself, but also her husband. And outside on Capitol Hill today, I even met some law students that traveled here from Louisiana to just come and be here for this moment. They wanted to just see this all play out in the nation's capital. One student, it was her very first time, and she said that because Judge Jackson has done this, she now feels like she has now trailblazed a path for her to do it as well. You know, Lindsay, you talked about this on air today, but for so long, long in this country, black people have felt like they have to work twice as hard for half as much. And it's been 233 years, 115 Supreme Court justices, 108 white men. This moment was 233 years in the making. And you could certainly feel the gravity of that playing out in the hearing room today, Lindsay. Yes, indeed. And, and those KBJ signs out there. And as you said, that her husband, that was just such a, a sweet mm -hmm. uh, a moment as he looked on as at his history making wife and, and looking ahead. He, is the math still in Jackson's favor to get confirmed? It, it certainly is. You know, Democrats, I think, are hoping for some bipartisan support. She certainly did receive it when she was confirmed to the D.C. Circuit, earning the support of three Republican senators. But there's no guarantees that that will happen this time around. The reality is, though, Democrats don't even need it. You know, elections do have consequences. Democrats have the majority. Judge Jackson can be confirmed with a simple majority, 51 votes. And they're on track to do just that, barring any surprises, Lindsay. Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. Let's bring in our senior Washington reporter, Devin Dwyer, who covers the court for us and was watching these hearings extra closely. Uh, Devin, good to have you with us. Uh, we did hear some of the, the framing, to be sure, of the questioning that Republicans plan to make tomorrow and in the coming days and, and some of the Democratic response, especially on the issue of sentencing on crime relating uh, to issues surrounding child pornography. Uh, uh, give us a sense how this all landed today and, and what it means for the days ahead. Yeah, Lindsay, Republicans really telegraphed how they're going to spend the next two days. They're going to ask about her judicial philosophy, her record as a public defender, uh, and some of the more than 500 federal court opinions she writ, uh, wrote as a district court judge. All of that's fair game, but it was uh, the critique from Senator Josh Hawley of, of Missouri that created the most controversy so far. He teased this uh, in a number of tweets late last week, uh, suggesting that Katanji Brown Jackson has a long record, his words, of letting child porn offenders off the hook when it comes to sentencing. Now, today he listed seven cases that he's been looking at in which she issued sentences below the federal guidelines for defendants uh, convicted of viewing or possessing child porn, uh, prison terms that were shorter than recommended. 
And it's all part of a Republican uh, effort here, Lindsay, to paint her as someone who's soft on crime. That's part of their campaign uh, agenda headed into the midterm elections. Democrats here pushed back hard. Senator Dick Durbin, chairman of the committee, uh, called this all misleading, baseless, and unfair. And in fact, our reporting, Lindsay, has found uh, that in fact, Ketanji Brown Jackson's rulings in these child porn cases were very much mainstream. In fact, Senator Josh Hawley himself voted for at least three federal judges with similar records when it comes to sentencing child porn offenders below the guidelines. He didn't see a problem then. He's apparently seeing a problem now. Uh, the National Review called his attacks a smear, and tomorrow, for the first time, Lindsay, we'll get a chance to hear from her directly when she'll be asked about those allegations. And, of course, he's pushing back, saying, well, in those cases, he wasn't making a decision for someone to become a Supreme Court justice. And we also got to see a bit of Jackson's demeanor, her poise in her opening statement today, and, and she goes into these hearings uh, with a fair amount of experience fielding questions uh, from the senators. After all, this is her fourth go-round. Her fourth go-round, no Supreme Court nominee in at least 30 years since Clarence Thomas has had as much experience in this room behind me, facing questions from the senator. She's ready for this moment, primed for the spotlight. Today was no doubt her biggest television audience, her introduction to the country. Uh, all of that will sort of come to, come to a head tomorrow. She'll begin to face the grilling from Republicans and Democrats, 11 members on each side, an experience that is unlike any other a federal judge will have in their career. Uh, and, Lindsay, we're told it will stretch for 19 hours of questions over the next two days. So buckle up. It's going to be a long haul. That's right. Long road ahead. All right, Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. Thanks, Lindsay. For more now on the historic day in the Senate, let's bring in New Jersey Democratic Senator Cory Booker from my home state. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Senator. It's good to be here with uh, Jersey. And. <laughs> and you spoke so eloquently about just what this day means for you and, and the younger generation as well. Let's take a listen. Forgive me, I grew up in a small black church where I was taught uh, to make a joyous noise unto the Lord. And this is not a normal day for America. We have never had this moment before. And I just want to talk about uh, the joy. I know tomorrow and the coming hearings, we're going to have tough, hard questions. But please, let me just acknowledge the fact that this is not normal. It's never happened before. I think it may have grown up in that same church, uh, Mr. Booker, <laughs> Senator Booker. Uh, some tonight are lamenting, though, that it took 233 years to get to this point. Uh, for many, certainly, there's a feeling of celebration. Uh, what were you thinking in this moment as you saw Judge Jackson start to wipe away tears right before she gave her opening statement? I mean, she made me emotional. Watching her husband made me emotional. Seeing her parents, who are so similar to my parents, both HBCU graduates, both came to Washington, D.C. She and I were both born here. Her mom and my mom worked in the D.C public schools. Uh, her dad graduated from the same college as my dad did. And I think there are many of us around this country, but even those who are not black, that look at her uh, and see someone they can relate to. Uh, this is an extraordinary moment for America, whatever your political background is, to have this many years, more than 200 years, of generally women being excluded, minorities being excluded. This is the shattering of a glass ceiling before our eyes, and generations to come will look back at this as a historic, seminal moment. And you spoke today about how we say justice for all, but there are those who believe that those words have been really diminished by a lack of representation if Judge Jackson is ultimately confirmed. In concrete terms, what might this mean as far as the, the notion of justice for all? Well, you've got somebody with a different lived experience, and we have a criminal justice system that is still rife with uh, injustice. We know this. Brian Stevenson, as I said today, says it so eloquently. We have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty uh, than poor and innocent. A lot of people don't feel like the gears of justice work for them because they're not wealthy, they're not privileged, or what have you. And we've seen tragedies in the criminal justice system uh, that just don't seem fair. Uh, the court itself, through the politics of our time, has lost legitimacy. And so I think this is going to be a very affirming moment for America. I think more Americans will look to the court now and feel like they are represented on it. But more importantly, uh, we have a woman of extraordinary competence. Uh, she has more judicial experience than most of the justices on the Supreme Court. She brings, uh, for the first time ever, 
public defender's perspective onto the Supreme Court, this is a good day for America. It'll add to the richness of the bench, uh, and I do believe it's going to add a lot more hope for better tomorrows. And our Devin Dwyer just reported on the issue Republican Josh Hawley has raised on Judge Brown's sentencing on crime-related issues, including child pornography. We also saw Senator Marsha Blackburn really just go in for the jugular today. When you saw this line of attack coming from your colleagues, what was your reaction? Was today the day for that? Well, look, they are senators, full-fledged members of the of the Judiciary Committee. They can use their 10 minutes for whatever they want. Uh, that's not my concern. The reality is, if you just look at who's vouching for uh, this justice already, Republicans and Democrats from the bench appointed by presidents of both parties are vouching for her. The fraternal order of police, this is one of the toughest and largest, it is the largest police union in the United States of America, has endorsed her. If you look at the fact that uh, uh, victims advocacy groups like the uh, 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 National Children's Alliance uh, has vouched for her. So a lot of these critiques are just not adding up and they won't hold up. Uh, their attempts to, I think, in many ways, try to undermine and besmirch the truth of the matter, which is she's an extraordinarily competent judge. She's been tough, fair, and she actually has been a bridge builder between the partisan divide. And I think she'll be a consensus builder on the court. And you just mentioned how so many Republicans have already come out and, and vouch for her. As you know, all three of former President Trump's nominees received close confirmation votes. Justice Gorsuch uh, got the most votes with 54. Do you anticipate that more than a couple, more than a handful of Republicans might support Judge Jackson? I hope so, and, uh, and I believe it's possible. Remember, as you already reported, she's been confirmed by the Senate in a bipartisan manner three times, and her most recent, uh, just less than a year ago, uh, she was confirmed by this Senate with a handful of Republican votes. So I'm very hopeful, and I think that um, now that people are taking a closer look, they're only going to discover better things about her. I was blown away in my private meeting with her. She is an extraordinary human being. Her story, the more she talked about her family and her life, uh, her grit and grace came out. I think that there is a chance that she can get even more than the vote she got for confirmation on the circuit court. But again, uh, I'm very confident she's going to be confirmed one way or the other. I think a bipartisan uh, vote, though, would be good for America, frankly. And finally, Senator, uh, before we let you go, in addition to serving on the Senate Judiciary Committee, you also serve on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. President Biden, as you know, is heading to Europe this week. And we've just seen some really disturbing reports of Russia laying the groundwork to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. Would that, in your mind, be a red line where the U.S. and NATO at that point just have to move past sanctions and get directly involved in this conflict? I'm not going to use that in any way to foreshadow to Putin uh, what we will do. Uh, I want him to know. Uh, that he has a more united NATO than I've seen in my lifetime, uh, that he has moved countries like Switzerland uh, from their normal neutral position into standing against his totalitarian-like tactics. Uh, what he's doing in Ukraine right now amounts, in my opinion, to a war crime. He is indiscriminately bombing citizens, civilians. Uh, it, is, it is despicable what's happening. So this coalition that we have is determined to stop him uh, and the Ukrainian people, their grit, uh, and their guts uh, is extraordinary. So we, what we're seeing on TV is awful, but I know uh, that uh, Putin has no pathway towards some kind of victory in Ukraine. And I know that free peoples of the world are more and more united uh, in this country, even in a bipartisan manner, to we're all united uh, in stopping Putin and standing in every way possible in support of Ukrainians. Senator Cory Booker, so appreciate your time and insight tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas will spend another night at Sibley Memorial Hospital as he continues treatment for flu-like symptoms. The Court Information Office says that Justice Thomas was admitted on Friday and is being treated with antibiotics. His illness is not COVID-related and is expected to be released in a day or two. And our coverage of the confirmation hearing of Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown-Jackson continues. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And now to the war in Ukraine and the deadliest single strike yet in the capital city of Kyiv, Russia missiles targeting a shopping mall. The moment of attack, you see it there, captured by a security camera in this video circulating on social media and verified by ABC News. The desperate rush to pull victims from the rubble, at least eight people killed. There's also a new curfew in Kyiv tonight as there are fears that Russian kill teams may be inside the city. Our Ian Panel reports in tonight once again from Kyiv. Tonight, the largest and deadliest strike yet on the capital. 
Kyiv has been rocked by massive explosions. Images emerging today of the size of the blast. Video verified by ABC News shows the moment the missile hit a shopping mall on the edge of Kyiv, killing at least eight people. As dawn broke, the sheer scale of the aftermath was revealed. Rescuers searching for survivors, pulling victims from the rubble. Residents nearby were left bewildered, searching for belongings in bombed-out buildings. The Russian military releasing this astonishing video they say is of the attack, claiming the site was used for a missile launcher and ammunition. The Ukrainians yet to comment. Now Kyiv ordering another 35-hour curfew amid fears Russian saboteurs or kill teams may be in the city. Despite the aerial attacks, a senior U.S. defense official saying Russian forces aren't making any progress on the ground. The Washington think tank, the Institute for the Study of War, going further, assessing that Ukraine has defeated the initial Russian campaign in this war and that the Kremlin no longer has the forces to take Kyiv and other major cities and to force a change of government. President Zelensky addressing the Ukrainian people, playing an air raid siren on his phone, a sound that everyone here knows and fears. Zelensky saying, with the sound of this siren, Ukrainians live, work, try to sleep, get treatment for wounds, give birth to children and die. And tonight, rescuers searching for survivors in the rubble of an art school in the besieged city of Mariupol after Russian forces attacked. Hundreds believed to be trapped. Ukrainians in the key port city defiantly rejecting Russian demands to surrender. The death toll soaring. Residents forced to bury the dead in the shadows of destroyed buildings. The Ukrainian foreign ministry now accusing the Russians of forcibly deporting thousands of city residents, including children, to parts of Russia. The US says it's investigating. In Kherson, the shocking images of Russians firing on a crowd of protesters. Verified video circulating online shows the moment Russian forces opened fire on the crowd. Firing stun grenades to try to break up the peaceful protest. At least four reportedly injured, one with a bullet wound. Now President Biden confirming Russia fired a new hypersonic missile for the first time in combat, hitting Ukrainian military targets. They've just uh, launched a hy their hypersonic missile because it's the only thing that they can get through with any absolute certainty. There's a reason they're using it. And now Putin's back against the wall. Seen here in a recent Russian training exercise, they're capable of being launched from more than a 1,000 miles away, reaching speeds 10 times the speed of sound. And tonight, the humanitarian crisis only getting worse. The United Nations saying a staggering 10 million Ukrainians have either fled the country or have been displaced internally. Half said to be children. Viktor Akendo is in Warsaw with hundreds of Ukrainians, mostly women and children, in line for a new cash assistance program organized by the UN Refugee Agency, the equivalent of about $165 per person distributed to the most vulnerable. So will this program help you start your new life here in Poland? Yeah. Kind of. I hope for, like, small boosts because, you know, like, it's just a new beginning. And tonight, back in Ukraine, the unthinkable. A Ukrainian who survived four concentration camps killed in a Russian attack in Kharkiv. 96-year-old Boris Romanchenko survived the Holocaust, but he was killed in Putin's war. What an awful end to that story. Ian Panel joins us now from Kyiv. Ian, a senior U.S. official says that Russia has made no advances for several days now. They believe as many as 10,000 Russian troops may have been killed. But Ian, tonight it's not clear if Russian citizens will ever even learn that information. Yeah, I mean, something of a mystery. It's interesting, the most read pro-Kremlin newspaper for a while appearing to report online that almost 10,000 Russian soldiers had been killed in this war and far more had been injured. Now, that is by far much higher than any official figures. But shortly after, here's where the mystery kicks in, that number suddenly disappeared from this article on their website, with the paper then later claiming that they'd actually been hacked. And in a further crackdown on free speech today, a Russian court officially outlawed 
ignoring Facebook and Instagram and labeling them as extremists. And you're absolutely right. There's a real question there as to how much information the Russian people are able to get about this war. And of course, the Kremlin doesn't even call it that. And certainly how many of their sons are being sent home in body bags. Mm. Lindsay? And, and Ian, going back to that horrific shopping center bombing in Kyiv, the city has been spared the worst of the civilian toll. But is there a concern at this point on the ground that that could soon change? Yeah, I think there is. Again, because of what you said earlier about the U.S. analysis and other people are seeing the same thing, that really the land invasion has stalled certainly around this area. They're unable to push further forward. Uh, the Ukrainians have reinforced their defenses. They say they have two rings, almost like rings of steel, uh, reinforced around the city. And we're not seeing any significant signs of more Russian forces coming up, uh, up here. And so I think what we're seeing here is what we've seen in other areas, this stepping up of this area aerial bombardment and when you fire missiles, uh, some of them from a very long range, they become less and less accurate. And of course, that inevitably leads to increased civilian casualties, increased destruction, increased death, uh, and of course forces more people from their homes. And we have to wait and see whether this starts to look like some of the terrible scenes from Mariupol and those other cities. But I think there is a fear that that is probably the next stage in this conflict. Lindsay? A real fear there. Ian Panel our thanks to you reporting in from Kiev once again. We turn now to things here at home as President Biden prepares for his upcoming trip to Brussels for an emergency summit. ABC's Terry Moran is at the White House for us. And Terry, today the president had a phone call with the leaders of France, Germany, Italy and the UK. Uh, what can we expect to come out of his trip in the coming days? Well, this is a, a critical moment, obviously, in this war with Russia stalemated on the battlefield so far and switching to this grinding, horrific war of bombardment and siege. Uh, today, an hour-long uh, call with crucial NATO leaders and then that summit later in the week looking for ways to answer this new moment with uh, undoubtedly more weapons and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, more pressure on Russia, more sanctions perhaps, uh, because things are getting even more desperate just uh, now, tonight, the president telling reporters reporters uh, that he can confirm he believes Russia has used that hypersonic missile. It was interesting what he said about it. He said that missile is a, quote, consequential weapon that is almost impossible to stop. But then he went on to explain why he thinks Russia is using such a weapon. He said it's the only thing they can get through with absolute certainty. And he said it shows that Putin's back is up against the wall. Uh, the president and the allies closely coordinating. They can sense that Russia is stalemated back on its heels and they want to take advantage of this moment. Lindsay? Shows perhaps a level of desperation there. Terry Moran reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Terry. Now tonight to the severe weather outbreak from Texas to the East Coast. 57 million Americans on high alert for severe storms, in some cases heavy spring snow and even tornadoes. Texas tonight already seeing at least one confirmed twister. Let's bring in our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, who's in Jackson, Mississippi for us. Ginger, it sounds like it could really be a dangerous next few days across the South. You know you're going to have a dynamic system in a couple of days when you've got a blizzard warning in the Texas Panhandle and just 200 some miles away, tornado watch with active tornadoes. So that's exactly what we're seeing. Already reports of schools hit in Jacksboro, Texas, just about an hour and a half northwest of Fort Worth. That same cell is crossing the Red River right into Oklahoma now, still torturing the land there. I wish it were just that cell. It is not. It is an entire line of storms that have passed through I-35, moving through really heavy populated areas. And we'll still have that ability to twist tonight, Lindsay. As it moves through Louisiana in the overnight hours, most of that's a damaging wind threat. But by tomorrow, late morning, early afternoon, enough heat, you add that and you've got the wind shear, and that means you could have more tornado action from Mississippi even into Alabama. So we're watching for this, that red area, with not only the chance of damaging wind, but also tornadoes. It's why I'm here in Jackson. It's an earlier in the day event, and it's really going to have to come together just right. But I have to tell you, if you are, do not have a shelter, you need to think about where you can find one uh, for tomorrow because that's the type of storm action we are getting into that time of year. And unfortunately, the, the line just keeps moving east. And so as we go through Wednesday, the Florida Panhandle into the Florida Georgia line there up through South Carolina, North Carolina, and even Southern Virginia will get in on this action. Lindsay? All right, we can't let the blue sky behind you fool us, I guess, but can see a little bit of that wind starting. You Ginger. need sun to make the storms, you're right. <laughs> oh, that's that makes sense. Ginger Z, our thanks to you.
And when we come back, the LAPD is asking for the public's help as they investigate what led to this high-speed stunt. We'll explain. And with the Oscars just days away, we take a look at the women making moves behind the scenes. But up next, it's been nearly a month of misery for the millions of refugees who have fled Ukraine. Our in-depth look at how they're trying to acclimate next. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva. Drama. Money and fame. Shaw amazing. The prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Mommy. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Just imagine if you had to leave everything you own behind to start an entirely new life in a new country. That is the reality for so many Ukrainians now trying to get back on their feet in Poland. The government, the Polish people, and many organizations are doing everything they can to help as refugees now attempt to settle in for the long haul. Our Victor Kendo has been traveling across Poland and brings us this in-depth report. They've been waiting for hours. Thousands of people now in a foreign land with an uncertain future. Not to see a football match at Warsaw National Stadium, but for a chance to score a social security number that will pave the way for a new life in a new country. We need to adapt to new life. Tonight, the Polish government and people rolling out the welcome mat for millions of Ukrainians escaping the war-torn country. Of the more than three million who have left Ukraine so far, two thirds have come to Poland the population in Poland's capital increasing by a staggering 20% in less than three weeks. Katia Pankiv explaining how they have no home to go back to in Lviv. I lost my job and lost my apartment because other refugees living there already. So we are looking for any possibilities to like to understand what we're standing on. She's one of many taking advantage of a new UN program now underway in Warsaw to distribute money to refugees. Some are sleeping in the rough and uh, 
they really need help. So we hope that this cash assistance acts as a bridge uh, 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 to get them on their feet. The need so great here. We met Ilya from Kyiv. He's been sleeping on the floor of a Warsaw train station with his grandmother, mom and sister, waiting to find a more permanent roof over their heads. I want to go in Kyiv. Went in Kyiv, but Russia. Timur and Olga arriving from Kharkiv with their family, traveling six days before making it to Warsaw. A line of buses waiting to take them and countless others to a help center. We don't have home there, don't have friends uh, in Warsaw. Everything is gone. Officials now urging Ukrainians to make their way to more rural areas and smaller towns where more resources may be available. At the moment, they are focused on the biggest cities because they think that this is like the, the, the main uh, chance for them. But in the smaller cities, there is also aid, there is also help, there are also people willing to help. In this town of 16,000 people, they've welcomed 600 refugees. Well, there's no way, I, as a dad, I can look at mums with kids, right, and not cry and think, what can we do? Andrew Edels offering his spare cottage to 14-year-old Oleva's family. Oleva, pictured here with his younger sister, mother, and grandmother last May, fleeing Kharkiv along with his cousin yeah. after spending days inside this bomb shelter with their dog. Him, it's uh, way better. First of all, no explosions. So you feel safer here. I feel way safer here. Only 40 minutes outside Warsaw, the town of Milanovic, a community opening their doors to the most in need. And to be clear, you've never met before, right? This mother and son fleeing Ukraine with all they could carry, now relying on strangers for shelter. This local Polish woman taking them to stay with her mother across town, and they are the lucky ones. Poles now creating makeshift shelters in any empty space they can find. We're inside of a shuttered mall, which was set to be demolished, but the owner decided to delay that and convert it into a help center. So now empty stores are lined with cots for refugees. There are also bathrooms and showers, providing a temporary solution until they find a more permanent place to live. This Polish theater becoming a temporary home a mother of five telling us they had to cover her windows with blankets to muffle the sound of sirens back home. Her children calling that the siren monster. The mayor of Warsaw now asking NATO allies to do more. We need uh, a system, a system in Europe and in the world to relocate refugees because we cannot do it alone. What I'm asking all of my friends in the Western world, help us out and let's do it in a way which is well planned, enough of uh, improvisation. Organizations offering free plane and train tickets to other parts of Europe to help ease the burden. Crowds continue to swarm Krakow's Ukrainian consulate. This line stretching for blocks in both directions to replace lost documents and passports. Outside that national stadium in Warsaw, thousands lining up to apply for their new Polish ID numbers, equivalent to social security numbers called a PESEL. Why was it so important to get that PESEL number? I need PESEL for many things. I need work, for money, for bank account, for staying here in Poland until the war ends. 2,600 PESEL numbers assigned in two days at the stadium alone, more than 120,000 throughout Poland and counting. They grant access to legally find work, apply for a mortgage, send children to school, and receive monthly public transportation passes. Inside the stadium, refugees bring their documents, fill out the paperwork, take new photos, and if approved, walk away with their new numbers within hours. We have about uh, 100 stalls here. For now, the maximum number of uh, people that can be processed one day is about 1,000. Olena registering her son, Ahad, for his new ID number, still in disarray, like so many others, she's now planning their new future in Poland. Our thanks to Victor for that. And still ahead here on Prime, the tragedy on the highway that led to the death of two state troopers in Pennsylvania. The deadly plane crash as investigators in China look into claims that it simply dropped out of the sky. And we now know no bracket has been safe on the men's side, but what about the women's NCAA tournament? We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day. The movie Selena is coming back to theaters.
deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. We are still absolutely buzzing about the St. Peter's Peacocks as the 15th seed secured their Cinderella spot in the NCAA Men's Sweet 16 this weekend. But the ladies also know how to throw it down, too. Let's take a look at the women's NCAA tournament by the numbers. This marks the first year that the women's tournament has also carried the March Madness branding, which has been reserved only for the men's tournament in prior years. The championship comes after an outcry last year over some of the subpar resources and facilities that women had in their tournament compared to their male counterparts. And this year, the women have lived up to the madness moniker with eight wins by double-digit seeds in the first two rounds so far, tying the record set in 2018. The biggest upsets came Sunday from two tenth seeds, knocking off a pair of top two seeds for the first time since 2016 as the Creighton Blue Jays beat Iowa and the South Dakota Coyotes dominated Baylor on their home court. That ended Baylor's streak of 12 straight appearances in the Sweet 16. But even with all the upsets, the four number one seeds have all advanced to the next round. That includes the defending champions from Stanford, whose Fran Belibi became just the third woman to put down a dunk in an NCAA tournament game, joining legends Candace Parker and Brittany Griner. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The deadly home explosion, several generations in one family wiped out in the investigation that's now underway. And a superstar who now says he's retiring. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live national parks are incredibly safe places a crime will happen my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. 
This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. GMA tomorrow, wake up with Matt. Perfect. Matt Damon. Good morning, America. Then Wednesday, say good morning to Pam. Pam Anderson live. Plus, we're counting down to Oscar, and nobody does Oscar like GMA. New warnings about BA2, the subvariant of Omicron. Dr. Anthony Fauci, chief medical advisor to President Biden, says it could become the dominant COVID strain in the U.S. It's 50 to 60 percent more transmissible than Omicron, which he says could turn into a slight blip in coronavirus cases over the next few weeks. But Dr. Fauci says it does not appear to cause more severe illness. Hopefully we won't see a surge. I don't think we will. Uh, the easiest way to prevent that is to continue to get people vaccinated and for those who have been vaccinated to continue to get them boosted. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is in the hospital. He was admitted Friday with flu-like symptoms. The court saying he was admitted to a D.C. area hospital Friday evening. He underwent tests, was diagnosed with an infection, and is being treated with intravenous antibiotics. The court saying he's expected to be released from the hospital in a day or two. The 73-year-old has no known health problems. He will not participate remotely in arguments. Police in Dryden, Michigan say four people have died after a mobile home fire. Local and state investigators are still on the scene searching for a cause, but officials say the fire started after an explosion that happened at 5 a.m. I heard of an explosion and it woke me up. And I came and looked out the door and the house was in a horrible blaze. Officials say it is too early to tell whether any foul play was involved. Video of a dramatic high-speed stunt in a Tesla is going viral. The video shows the vehicle going airborne and crashing into two parked cars just as it lands. The rented Tesla was abandoned at the scene. This video posted on YouTube, there you see it, shows the Tesla airborne as it gets to the top of a hill in Los Angeles. I opened up the door to look outside and there was a headlight right next to my front door and then I went out onto the road and there was just broken up garbage pails strewn everywhere. LAPD is asking for help from the public to identify the driver who is still on the run and offering a reward of $1,000 for information that leads to an arrest. It looks like a trooper might be down. Uh, they're doing CPR on him right now. Officials say two state troopers were responding to a call about an individual walking on I-95 southbound. The state police officers were killed while trying to help a man walking along the roadway. All three were standing on the highway when they were fatally struck by a suspected impaired driver who's now in custody. Dispatch tried to attempt to contact the troopers, at which point they couldn't, and they sent back up. Upon arrival of the other troopers, there were some witnesses attempting CPR on the troopers on the left side of the road.
At this point, they were pronounced deceased. Governor Wolf has ordered all flags at state buildings to be flown at half-staff in remembrance of the troopers' ultimate sacrifice. On behalf of all Pennsylvanians, I want to extend my deepest sympathies and condolences. We are so, so sorry for the loss that we have all experienced today. Iconic reggaeton artist Daddy Yankee has announced his plans to retire after a final farewell tour and the release of what will be his last album, Legend Daddy, later this month. The Puerto Rican-born rapper made the announcement in a video he posted on social media. A tragedy to report out of China today after a plane carrying more than 100 passengers crashed. No survivors are expected. Devastated families are now demanding answers once again from Boeing. ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the latest. Tonight, China Eastern Airlines grounding its entire fleet of Boeing 737-800s after that plane crash in a mountainous region of China. Drone video capturing the devastating debris field. Chinese state media showing rescuers searching through the wreckage. 132 people were on board, none of them foreign nationals, and so far, no sign of survivors. The plane, only about six years old. What we know is this. The airplane was at 29,000 feet. The crew apparently decided to do an emergency descent. We don't know that for a fact, but it sure looks like it. And within two minutes, they are 20,000 feet lower and coming down at a very high rate of speed. Early data shows the flight from Kunming, China, was about three quarters of the way to Guangzhou, nearly 100 miles from Hong Kong, when it just plummeted, crashing while moving at more than 430 miles per hour. What the investigator is going to be looking for primarily are the so-called black boxes, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. That's going to have a huge amount of information. Chinese aviation has a strong safety record, its last major crash happening almost 12 years ago. And while so much attention has been on the newer 737 MAX model after those two deadly crashes in 2018 and 2019, this crash involved a regular 737, the most popular commercial plane in the world. Boeing tonight telling ABC News, our thoughts are with the passengers and crew. We are working with our airline customer and are ready to support them. Gio Benitez joins us now. Gio, even though no Americans were on board, is our government providing any kind of support for this investigation into the crash? Absolutely, Lindsay, because remember, Boeing is an American company, and because this was a Boeing plane, of course, we really need to figure out exactly what happened here. So Boeing, the engine manufacturer, the FAA, and the NTSB, they are all joining in and helping Chinese investigators. Gio Benitez reporting in for us. Thanks so much, Rich Gio. Thank you, Lindsay. People in Russia who even use the words war or invasion could potentially face up to 15 years in prison. Many Russians are calling this Putin's war, fleeing the country with very few other options. ABC's James Longman has this story. A Russian revolt, tens of thousands fleeing the country and their president. Putin with the terrifying term self-cleanse of what he calls traitors and scum. Those who even use the words war or invasion now risk 15 years in prison. <laughs> Russian journalist Marina Ovsianikova speaking out after staging this anti-war protest during a live broadcast on Russian state news, running onto set with a sign reading, no war and don't believe the propaganda, they're lying to you here. You now face the prospect of years... She told our George Stephanopoulos why she did it. What compelled you to take that risk? Russian people are really against uh, the war. It's uh, Putin's war, not Russian people's war. She was immediately taken into custody and fined, but could face more charges. With this action, I wanted to demonstrate to the world that not all Russian people believe the same. Many young people also fear being called up to the military. So with lives threatened, sanctions biting and futures ruined, the only choice is to run. Some 80,000 now in Armenia, 25,000 in in neighboring Georgia, others heading to Turkey, and if they have visas, even further afield. Some Russians even showing up at the U.S. southern border, where dozens have already been turned away. Days after the war started, Ilya Venyavkin, a historian and educator, fled Moscow with his wife and children to Georgia. We'll have to leave for many reasons, for our kids, for our safety, for our mental health, for some kind of moral dignity, because it's very frustrating to be in Russia at that moment and understand that we can't 
change it. It's impossible to know what Putin fears, but the anguish of the mothers of Russian soldiers risks making his war even more unpopular in Russia. One speaking to us during a protest in Moscow, showing us a photograph of her 22-year-old son. Just heartbreaking to see that. Our thanks to James. And now our look ahead to the Academy Awards this Sunday. You'll spot these two on the red carpet at the Oscars, both up for Best Original Song, a rich category over the years, as you're about to hear. From love songs to rap battles. To iconic dance sequences. The Oscar nominees for Best Original Song provide the soundtrack to our favorite movies. There's just no time to die. This year, 20-year-old pop superstar Billie Eilish is in the running for the very first time for her James Bond anthem, No Time to Die. I just feel so like lucky to be a part of this and to be able to say that we're nominated for an Oscar. It's the craziest thing in the world. The Oscars was like a, a family event at our house. It yeah. was it was like I I honestly forgot that this was even part of our childhood, but I remembered the other day that we would have friends over every year at the Oscars. It was friends over, you get dressed and eat food and we would all watch the Oscars yeah. live. Meanwhile, legendary songwriter Diane Warren is nominated for Somehow You Do from Four Good Days. If you win an Oscar in 2022, what will that mean to you and how will you celebrate? Well, I will faint yeah. if they say my name. Yeah. This, this, I, I've been, this is my 13th nomination. Yeah. I've never won yet. You've been waiting. I've been waiting. Been I've been waiting 34 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So know. maybe this is the year. Lucky number 13? Yeah. 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 Lucky number 13. For these women behind the lens, the nomination is an honor. Eilish calling it a peak life experience. It's really just a once in a lifetime thing and getting nominated is the real part that's important, you know? And I, I am a big fan of everyone in our category so I would want that all of them to win. I'm humbled by that because the people that nominate in, in my category, in the music category for, for song and score are, are the best of the best of the best of the best. And good luck on Sunday. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. For the first time in two years, revelers, onlookers, and anyone else who likes to look at gorgeous photos are able to head to our nation's capital for the annual Cherry Blossom Festival. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. hour if judge jackson becomes justice jackson how could she influence a conservative leaning court we'll delve into that and what are will and kate up to during their week-long trip in the caribbean stay with us With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom, my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. 
These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. System-wide outages for Apple today, including iMessage, the App Store, Apple Music, and iCloud services. Services did start to come back online late this afternoon. The company has not revealed the cause of the outage. The chair of the Federal Reserve says it would raise its benchmark short-term interest rate faster than expected and high enough to restrain hiring and growth if it decides that's the only way to slow skyrocketing inflation. His remarks caused a sharp drop in the stock market. Extreme weather is fueling deadly wildfires across the country. A wildfire in central Texas that started over the weekend has burned more than 11,000 acres and injured a firefighter. The wildfire known as Big L by the Texas A&M Forest Service started in a grassy area. Gusty winds and dry heat caused the fire to spread quickly. An entire city was evacuated. And we turn now to the history in Washington today as the Supreme Court confirmation hearing is now underway for the first black woman. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson getting emotional today just before giving her opening statement. Judge Jackson telling the Senate Judiciary Committee how her parents raised her, telling her if she worked hard and believed in herself in America, she could do anything or be anything she wanted to be. Today, the 22 senators who will help determine if that American dream will include her serving on the nation's highest court gave their opening statements. Many praised her qualifications, but several Republicans also outlined some of their doubts. While today was a bit of a victory lap, tomorrow the real work begins with lots of tough questions. The Democrats likely have the votes to confirm Judge Jackson on their own, but they do hope to convince some Republicans to vote with them as well. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. On the first day of her confirmation hearings, the weight of history plain to see on the face of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Judge Jackson introducing herself to the country as the daughter of school teachers. To express both pride in their heritage and hope for the future, they gave me an African name, Katanji Onyika, which they were told means lovely one. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, my path was clearer. So that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. Her father, Johnny Brown, there behind her, as she described how he inspired her by becoming a lawyer himself. My very earliest memories are of watching my father study. He had his stack of law books on the kitchen table while I sat across from him with my stack of coloring books. Her husband, Dr. Patrick Jackson, a surgeon overwhelmed with emotion. I have no doubt that without him by my side from the very beginning of this incredible professional journey, none of this would have been possible. We met in college more than three decades ago, and since then, he's been the best husband, father, and friend I could ever imagine. Patrick, I love you. As her two daughters looked on, Jackson acknowledging the challenges of being a working mother. Girls, I know it has not been easy as I've tried to navigate the challenges of juggling my career and motherhood. And I fully admit that I did not always get the balance right. But I hope that you've seen that with hard work, determination, and love, it can be done. I am so looking forward to seeing what each of you chooses to do with your amazing lives in this incredible country. 
This is her fourth Senate confirmation hearing. She's been a judge for nearly a decade and said it's her duty to be independent. I know that my role as a judge is a limited one, that the Constitution empowers me only to decide cases and controversies that are properly presented. And I know that my judicial role is further constrained by careful adherence to precedent. And she closed with this. I have dedicated my career to ensuring that the words engraved on the front of the Supreme Court building, equal justice under law, are a reality and not just an ideal. Thank you for this historic chance to join the highest court, to work with brilliant colleagues, to inspire future generations, and to ensure liberty and justice for all. The chair of the Judiciary Committee ending today's hearing saying, now comes the hard part. In a way, it's the easiest day because 10 minutes is merely a throat-clearing warm-up for most senators on this committee. <laughs> Starting tomorrow will be some serious exchange in questions. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, certainly a historic day for this nomination. Uh, just give us a sense of the mood and the emotion surrounding today's hearing. Yeah, Lindsay, you could really feel the weight of this moment in the room, not only from the emotions from Judge Jackson herself, but also her husband. And outside on Capitol Hill today, I even met some law students that traveled here from Louisiana to just come and be here for this moment. They wanted to just see this all play out in the nation's capital. One student, it was her very first time, and she said that because Judge Jackson has done this, she now feels like she has now trailblazed a path for her to do it as well. You know, Lindsay, you talked about this on air today, but for so long, long in this country, black people have felt like they have to work twice as hard for half as much. And it's been 233 years, 115 Supreme Court justices, 108 white men. This moment was 233 years in the making, and you could certainly feel the gravity of that playing out in the hearing room today, Lindsay. Yes, indeed. And, and those KBJ signs out there, and as you said, that her husband, that was just such a, a sweet uh, a moment as he looked on as, at his history-making wife. And, and looking ahead, it, is the math still in Jackson's favor to get confirmed? It, it certainly is. You know, Democrats, I think, are hoping for some bipartisan support. She certainly did receive it when she was confirmed to the D.C. Circuit, earning the support of three Republican senators. But there's no guarantees that that will happen this time around. The reality is, though, Democrats don't even need it. You know, elections do have consequences. Democrats have the majority. Judge Jackson can be confirmed with a simple majority, 51 votes. And they're on track to do just that, barring any surprises, Lindsay. Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. So where would Katanji Brown Jackson fit on the bench? ABC News Supreme Court contributor Kate Shaw joins us now to talk a big picture. Good to have you here. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to yeah, be here. And I just want to start it off because when I first came in and saw you were kind of wiping away tears, it was an emotional moment for you. It was moving just as Judge Jackson's husband sort of teared up yes. as she was talking. I found myself having the same reaction, in particular when she talked about the challenges of balancing an intense career and being a parent, right? I'm a mom. You're a mom. It is a struggle. It is real. It's real. And <laughs> hearing her acknowledge both the struggle and the fact that you don't have to achieve perfection at any given moment. It's the trajectory that matters. And for her daughter sitting there and all of our daughters sitting wherever they are to see her before the Senate and with such an amazing opening, I thought her statement was fantastic. It was really moving. It really was. And I, I would bet that, that she's probably balancing it all you know, pr uh, pretty well. You know, people like to categorize everybody, right? So how would you, what category would you put her in as far as liberal, moderate? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that she will be a justice very much in the mold of Justice Breyer, who she's been chosen to replace. So a liberal, um, but certainly well within the mainstream. I think she will probably deviate in some areas from the opinions that he would have reached. I think, you know, he often sided with the government in criminal justice cases. She might not. Um, she might break with him on some religious liberty cases. But for the most part, she'll be, I think, a justice in his model. Um, but I do think that, you know, 
she will be a significant change in, on the court, even if her votes don't differ from Justice Breyer's likely votes very often, right? You will have the three liberal justices on the court will be three women, two of them women of color. Um, and even if what they are doing is just issuing righteous dissents in cases, mm -hmm. I think that will have a certain symbolic and substantive quality because it is emanating from these three female justices um, that will just, I think, mark a real change on the court. Again, even if the results in cases aren't any different. It's that difference between the voice versus the vote, yes. right? And and they will certainly have, and she will, if confirmed, have a, a unique perspective and voice there. Any upcoming cases that you think she might tip the scale? You know, there are a couple of big cases next fall, um, on a, you know, a case on the future of affirmative action out of Harvard and UNC. Which she might recuse herself from, right? It is possible, right? So she is a trustee um, of Harvard, and so it's conceivable she could recuse herself in the Harvard case, but there's another case, a UNC case, that I don't think she'd have to recuse from, so she could still participate. Um, a case involving the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act, that's one where her vote potentially could be outcome determinative. But look, it's a very conservative 6-3 court. So again, I don't think she's likely to change the outcome in very many cases because she'll be voting the way Breyer did. So I think it's a different kind of change she's likely to bring. There's been some discussion about honoring the Ginsburg rule, of course, famously named after the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who uh, deflected at her confirmation hearing, saying that she wasn't going to opine about how she might rule in a hypothetical case. Do you expect that we'll have more of the same from Judge Jackson? I got to confess, I think it's a little unfairly named the Ginsburg rule because she was actually pretty forthcoming about certain issues, things like reproductive rights and justice. But of course, you're right, it is called that rule. And the norm today is that, you know, these nominees are pretty non-committal and evasive. I think that was particularly true of President Trump's three nominees and particularly his most recent nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. She really didn't answer very many questions directly. So yeah, I mean, I expect that kind of, you know, the model of deflection on particular cases Judge Jackson will adhere to. Uh, it's important, you know, to get the votes. And I think she and the White House will understand that is the ultimate mission, even if law professors like me would like a more substantive exchange about, you know, what the Constitution means, how we should read it, things like that. Um, so, you know, I think we will learn about her, but we won't learn how she'll vote on individual cases. And, and you know, maybe that's appropriate given where these confirmation hearings are today. Just in the last 30 seconds while I have you here, we've already heard from Senator Howley and, and Senator McConnell. Um, as far as the idea that she might be soft on crime, that, that perhaps her, her history as a public defender, she's more empathetic to criminals. Do you feel like that's a fair criti criticism? I think that all of her sentencing decisions from the district court suggest she is well within the mainstream. And does her experience as a defender shape the way she approaches criminal cases? I'm sure it does, but we've got former prosecutors on the Supreme Court. Criminal cases should have, you know, criminal cases should be decided by the court with input from individuals who have seen all sides of the criminal justice system. So I, I really don't think that's a fair attack, no. Kate Shaw, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you, Lindsay. Our coverage of the confirmation hearing of Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown-Jackson continues. Join us tomorrow morning at 9. Now to the war in Ukraine. The capital city of Kyiv saw its deadliest single strike yet. Russian missiles, you see it there, hit a mall. That moment captured by a security camera in this video circulating on social media and verified by ABC News. The desperate rush to pull victims from the rubble, at least eight people killed. There's also a new curfew in Kyiv as there are fears that Russian kill teams may be in inside the city. Our Ian Panel reports. Tonight, the largest and deadliest strike yet on the capital. Kyiv has been rocked by massive explosions. Images emerging today of the size of the blast. Video verified by ABC News shows the moment the missile hit a shopping mall on the edge of Kyiv, killing at least eight people. As dawn broke, the sheer scale of the aftermath was revealed. Rescuers searching for survivors pulling victims from the rubble. <laughs> Residents nearby were left bewildered, searching for belongings in bombed-out buildings. The Russian military releasing this astonishing video they say is of the attack, claiming the site was used for a missile launcher and ammunition. The Ukrainians yet to comment. Now Kyiv ordering another 35-hour curfew amid fears Russian saboteurs or kill teams may be in the city. Despite the aerial attacks, a senior U.S. defense official saying Russian forces aren't making any progress on the ground. The Washington think tank, the Institute for the Study of War, going further, assessing that Ukraine has defeated the initial Russian campaign in this war and that the Kremlin no longer has the forces to take Kyiv and other major cities and to force a change of government.
President Zelensky addressing the Ukrainian people, playing an air raid siren on his phone, a sound that everyone here knows and fears. Zelensky saying, with the sound of this siren, Ukrainians live. Work, try to sleep, get treatment for wounds, give birth to children and die. And tonight, rescuers searching for survivors in the rubble of an art school in the besieged city of Mariupol after Russian forces attacked. Hundreds believed to be trapped. Ukrainians in the key port city defiantly rejecting Russian demands to surrender. The death toll soaring. Residents forced to bury the dead in the shadows of destroyed buildings. The Ukrainian foreign ministry now accusing the Russians of forcibly deporting thousands of city residents, including children, to parts of Russia. The U.S. says it's investigating. In Kherson, the shocking images of Russians firing on a crowd of protesters. Verified video circulating online shows the moment Russian forces opened fire on the crowd. Firing stun grenades to try to break up the peaceful protest. At least four reportedly injured, one with a blood wound. Now President Biden confirming Russia fired a new hypersonic missile for the first time in combat, hitting Ukrainian military targets. They've just uh, launched a hy their hypersonic missile because it's the only thing that they can get through with any absolute certainty. There's a reason they're using it. And now Putin's back against the wall. Seen here in a recent Russian training exercise, they're capable of being launched from more than a thousand miles away, reaching speeds ten times the speed of sound. And tonight, the humanitarian crisis only getting worse. The United Nations saying a staggering 10 million Ukrainians have either fled the country or have been displaced internally. Half said to be children. Viktor Akendo is in Warsaw with hundreds of Ukrainians, mostly women and children, in line for a new cash assistance program organized by the UN Refugee Agency, the equivalent of about $165 per person distributed to the most vulnerable. So will this program help you start your new life here in yeah. Poland? Kind of. I hope for like small boosts because, you know, like it's just a new beginning. And tonight, back in Ukraine, the unthinkable. A Ukrainian who survived four concentration camps killed in a Russian attack in Kharkiv. 96-year-old Boris Romanchenko survived the Holocaust, but he was killed in Putin's war. What an awful end to that story. Our thanks to Ian. And imagine if you had to leave everything that you own behind to start a new life in a new country. That is the grim reality for so many Ukrainians trying to get back on their feet tonight in Poland. The government, the Polish people, many organizations are doing everything they can to try to help refugees attempt to settle in for the long haul. Our Victor Akendo has been traveling across Poland and brings us this report. They've been waiting for hours thousands of people now in a foreign land with an uncertain future. Not to see a football match at Warsaw National Stadium, but for a chance to score a social security number that will pave the way for a new life in a new country. We need to adapt to a new life. Tonight, the Polish government and people rolling out the welcome mat for millions of Ukrainians escaping the war-torn country. Of the more than three million who have left Ukraine so far, two-thirds have come to Poland, the population in Poland's capital increasing by a staggering 20% in less than three weeks. Katia Pankiv explaining how they have no home to go back to in Lviv. I lost my job and lost my apartment because other refugees living there already. So we are looking for any possibilities to, like, to understand what we're standing on. She's one of many taking advantage of a new UN program now underway in Warsaw to distribute money to refugees. Some are sleeping in the rough and uh, they really need help. So we hope that this cash assistance acts as a bridge uh, 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 to get them on their feet. The need so great here. We met Ilya from Kyiv. He's been sleeping on the floor of a Warsaw train station with his grandmother, mom, and sister, waiting to find a more permanent roof over their heads. I want to go in Kyiv, go in Kyiv, but Russia. Timur and Olga arriving from Kharkiv with their family, traveling six days before making it to Warsaw. A line of buses waiting to take them and countless others to a help center. 
we don't have home there, don't have friends uh, in Polish. No, in Everything is gone. Officials now urging Ukrainians to make their way to more rural areas and smaller towns where more resources may be available. At the moment, they are focused on the biggest cities because they think that this is like the, the, the main uh, chance for them. But in the smaller cities, there is also aid, there is also help, there are also people willing to help. In this town of 16,000 people, they've welcomed 600 refugees. Well, there's no way, I, as a dad, I can look at mums with kids right, and not cry and think, what can we do? Andrew Edels offering his spare cottage to 14-year-old Oleva's family. Oleva, pictured here with his younger sister, mother and grandmother last May, fleeing Kharkiv along with his cousin yeah. after spending days inside this bomb shelter with their dog. Here it's uh, way better. First of all, no explosions. So you feel safer here? I feel way safer here. Only 40 minutes outside Warsaw, the town of Milanovic, a community opening their doors to the most in need. And to be clear, you've never met before, right? This mother and son fleeing Ukraine with all they could carry, now relying on strangers for shelter. This local Polish woman taking them to stay with her mother across town. And they are the lucky ones. Poles now creating makeshift shelters in any empty space they can find. We're inside of a shuttered mall, which was set to be demolished, but the owner decided to delay that and convert it into a help center. So now empty stores are lined with cots for refugees. There are also bathrooms and showers, providing a temporary solution until they find a more permanent place to live. This Polish theater becoming a temporary home. A mother of five telling us they had to cover her windows with blankets to muffle the sound of sirens back home, her children calling that the siren monster. The mayor of Warsaw now asking NATO allies to do more. We need uh, a system, a system in Europe and in the world to relocate refugees because we cannot do it alone. What I'm asking all of my friends in the Western world, help us out and let's do it in a way which is well planned, enough of uh, improvisation. Organizations offering free plane and train tickets to other parts of Europe to help ease the burden. Crowds continue to swarm Krakow's Ukrainian consulate. This line stretching for blocks in both directions to replace lost documents and passports. Outside that national stadium in Warsaw, thousands lining up to apply for their new Polish ID numbers, equivalent to social security numbers called a PESEL. Why was it so important to get that PESEL number? I need PESEL for many things. I need work, for money, for bank account, for staying here in Poland until the war ends. 2,600 PESEL numbers assigned in two days at the stadium alone, more than 120,000 throughout Poland and counting. They grant access to legally find work, apply for a mortgage, send children to school, and receive monthly public transportation passes. Inside the stadium, refugees bring their documents, fill out the paperwork, take new photos, and if approved, walk away with their new numbers within hours. We have about uh, 100 stalls here. For now, the maximum number of uh, people that can be processed one day is about 1,000. Olena registering her son, Ahad, for his new ID number. Still in disarray, like so many others, she's now planning their new future in Poland. Our thanks to Victor, and still to come, the investigation into the deadly plane crash in China. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You had this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A Boeing 737 carrying 132 passengers crashed into the mountains in southern China. China Eastern Airlines said the cause of the crash is still under investigation and deeply mourned the loss of passengers and crew. According to local media, there were no foreigners on the flight. Due to the crash, China Eastern grounded its fleet of 737-800s, which is the predecessor to the 737 MAX that had been grounded in China for more than three years following fatal crashes in 2018 and 2019. Archaeologists have uncovered five ancient tombs with well-preserved paintings at a cemetery just outside of Cairo in Egypt. According to the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the tombs are more than 4,000 years old. The discovery consisted of large stone coffins, wooden coffins, and other artifacts, including small statues and pottery. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge visited Belize as part of their tour through the Caribbean. Their visit was received with mixed reactions from some residents of Belize, given that the country was known as British Honduras until 1973. A local protest led to some scheduling changes for the royals, but ultimately they were able to dance and grind cacao with locals. And still ahead, the teacher in dire need of a kidney and the student stepped up. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, Shaw amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Great value buttermilk pancake and waffle mix has been recalled from Walmart stores across the country. According to the FDA, Continental Mills, the company that makes the mix, issued the recall after finding cable fragments in some boxes. Thankfully, as of Saturday, no injuries have been reported. For a decade, Valerie Bishop taught her students the ins and outs of cosmetology at Wake Tech in Raleigh, North Carolina. During eight of those 10 years, she silently suffered from a progressive form of kidney disease, pushing her to the point of desperately needing a donor. And that's when one of her students raised their hand. Joel Brown from our sister station, WTVD, brings us this incredible story of sacrifice and support in tonight's Local Lowdown. I'm sure you knew you had some students that liked you. Did you know they loved you so much? They have definitely showed their love. They, they, they have stepped above and beyond. This is how Valerie Bishop's Wake Tech students know her best, the kind, compassionate cosmetology professor with a smile that lights up the classroom. What they didn't know until a few months ago, Ms. Bishop's kidney disease had turned stage five renal failure, both kidneys rapidly deteriorating. It's irreversible. In desperate need of a new kidney, Bishop was finding it harder to keep the severity of her condition a secret. I shared with my students that I may be missing some time because I have to do doctor, doctor appointments and they were inquiring, well, what was going on? When I want to do something, I, I do it. And <laughs> I'm an arm twister. That's Carrie Fisher, one of Bishop's current students who didn't just inquire about her professor's health. She offered up her own kidney. She wants to be the donor. Shocked? So was Ms. Bishop. And I'm like, girl, bye. No, you, you, you can't do that. And she was like, uh, yes, I can. 
So since late last year, Carrie's been undergoing a battery of donor tests, hoping she's a match. She lost 38 pounds in less than three months to get to the acceptable BMI. There is no way if this was not meant to be, there is no way that I would have lost that much weight. And meanwhile, Bishop's almost endless circle of current and former caring students rallied around her as well. As hope grew of a potential donor, Bishop's daughter Zoe organized a GoFundMe to help with medical costs. And former students like Daria Gonzalez. Yes, yes, she's amazing. Made it their mission to get the word out. I can't do a whole lot, but maybe just raise awareness. Um, and that's, that's my goal. Then that big moment, UNC Hospital alerts Carrie on her phone. She and Bishop are a match said, which one do you want, the left or the right? We're a match, baby. She just started bawling. And she said, I can't believe this. This wasn't just something, this wasn't a gesture, it wasn't just some empty gesture. She's willing to work for it. What did that mean to you? But my students have been such a blessing to me in so many different ways. So I'm just, I'm just grateful. All the best to Miss Bishop. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC.